we used to sit there for ages just looking up at the stars and you could see the Milky Way as and touch it. It was so awesome. It really was. Crazy, yeah, they, they were in the next stream. Wake up, wake up, Hitler's come to bomb us. This is how, uh, how our young childhood was. Well, I was born in 1948, um, not long, too long after the war, and my earliest recollections was when I was about four years old. Uh, my brother going to school, and I didn't like that because I'd got no one to play with. And I vividly remember crying at the gate while he went to school and I was there stomping about. There was no uh, nursery schools in those days. I lived in a council house with my grandmother, and my mum and dad, and my brother, and it was very, very sparse in the council house. We had no electricity, we had no hot water, we had to boil the water if we wanted hot water. We had one cold tap uh, from a lead pipe in the kitchen, which we had to fill the tin bath up um, with kettles, uh, boiled water. And uh, another vivid memory is on a winter's morning waking up to find ice on the inside of the windows and the water by my bed frozen. And the old stories about great coats on the bed is very, very true because that's exactly what we did have on the beds was coats and great coats. There were no quilts. My mother never ever locked the door. The doors were always open. Um, and she said, well, you can trust everyone in the village. And I realized as I got older, it was nothing to do with trust. We just hadn't got anything to steal. If anyone wanted a pegged rug, which is a rug that I helped my mother make with a sack bag and some cut up jumpers, or a piece of liner, which is all we got on the floor, then they were very welcome to it. We got no television, we hadn't got a telephone. There were no computers and laptops in those days. Um, we cooked and uh, baked on the fire, which was a black cast iron fire. The washing was done in a copper, which we had to boil the water by setting fire to a big fire underneath a big copper drum. And we had a, a, a cold water tank from the roof water, which we actually pumped into the, uh, into the copper to make the hot water. Um, we had gas mantles, there was no electricity. So when it got dark, we literally went to bed and the toilet was about, uh, I would say, 20 yards down the garden. And it wasn't a flush toilet, it was um, a bin which had to be emptied once every week. But of course, in times when we were feeling a little bit poorly, then uh, my granddad would empty it uh, into the bean trench. And uh, the, the saying often, often went true that uh, these beans and uh, did you grow them yourself? And my granddad, did you say yes? And they say, well, they taste like Shh, you know what? <laughs> and that's why. That's why, <laughs> because all of the uh, excess effluence was poured into the bean trench. We lived on a street with a lot of other families. We weren't a, a necessarily big family. There was only me and my brother until my sister came along, and. Uh, at the top of the lane, there was a family of 11. Next door to them, there was a family of 10. And across the road, there was a family of eight. So there was never anybody short to play with. We was out all day, every day, uh, when we weren't at school. And uh, we used to play up at the gravel pits as were then, the nat it's a nature reserve now. And a lot of the footpaths, which are now used to guide school children, etc., on nature walks, we made when we were children. And that's why I know them like the back of my hand, because as I say, we, we made all of the paths. The, the other thing as well, which is worth mentioning, is that parents never worried about us. We, we, we went off at a very, very early age and was gone all day. And when it started to get dusk, then we'd come home. Or if we were hungry, we'd come home. And that was it, and the only time. But they never worried about, oh, I wonder where they are. Crap, they've been gone an awful long time. No such thing. We all looked after each other. Everyone knew everyone else. And if I weren't at one house, I'd be at another, and vice versa, they'd be at our house. 
and uh, none of us had got any money. We had no money whatsoever. We was all very poor, in fact, and we lived literally from week to week. I was forced to go to church, uh, to uh, chapel, until I was uh, old enough to go to church. And my godmother, who lived opposite, uh, forced me, and I mean forced, literally. And many a time I had a thick ear, a belt round the head. And she always used to make sure that I was well dressed, as, as well as we could dress then, to go to, uh, to chapel and then to church. We, we couldn't afford to buy bicycles. We couldn't afford to uh, uh, do anything like that. So we had a, a, a local council dump up at the top of the road, which was very handy for us kids because everybody used to chuck their old stuff out, which we made good use of. And we used to build bikes and trolleys from that tip. And for many years, uh, we all had bikes, which was built from every other bike in the, in the world. I'm not saying that they all had brakes, they didn't, and that was a, a, a lasting concern of the local constabulary. Our local Bobby lived opposite us, and uh, he used to many a time stop me for having no brakes, give me a clip round the ear roll, and he said, I'll tell your dad. And uh, it was my dad who helped me bake the bike with no brakes, so he didn't get far with that one. The village Bobby, Mr. Dickinson, God rest his soul, he's died now, but uh, he, he was, um, he was good. He was a good, good-hearted bloke. He was, he was looked after us kids, and uh, in a way, I think he enjoyed having us around because he used to chase us all over the place. And we used to have a telephone box on the the corner of the co-op in the in the village, and even he hadn't got a telephone in the house. He had to use the phone box to keep in touch with his superintendent, and so he used to use the phone box and the corner as his office. And all us kids used to gather on the co-op corner, which was opposite the local pub. And uh, that's where we used to make our mischief and go about our business and stuff. And of course, Mr. Dickinson, Dicko as we called him, he was there in his uniform. But one night we was feeling particularly devilish and he went into the, the call box and told us all to be very quiet while he found his superintendent. But we were very prepared because we got a piece of rope and we were so skinny in those days, nobody was fat. Uh, we actually could get behind the phone box. So we got behind the phone box with this rope and tied Mr. Dickinson in the phone box. And uh, we wouldn't undo the rope because he couldn't get out of the phone box. And he threatened us, he threatened to kill us all. And uh, in the end, he says, right, if you don't open this door, you know, I am going to dial 999, I'll get the police down here and what, what. He was getting quite concerned, as we all were, because we thought if we let him out, he will kill us. <laughs> so he undid the knot on the door and ran like hell. Eventually he caught us one by one, a bit like a Charles Bronson film, and boy, did he give us a good idea. <laughs> he, he clipped our ear holes, and we dare go home and tell his mum and dad, as they would have clipped it as well. So uh, this is how, uh, how our young childhood was, avoiding the local bobby, making as much mischief as we could by knock it and run, as we used to knock on people's doors and run like mad, and uh, uh, causing havoc for everyone. There, were, there was many, many occasions where I could, I could sort of relate, but uh, just picking one or two of the big ones up, the, uh, the, the, the day that the policeman chased us on a, uh, around the village, and I think he enjoyed it, because it was a bitterly cold night, and he lay in wait for us one night. We were playing foxes and hounds and he decided to join in. He had a helmet on and his black cape and he could hide anywhere and you'd never see him. It was pitch black. The lighting was awful in those days anyway. And uh, he stood there with a big bucket of cold water and he chucked it over us. And as I say, it was a bitterly cold night. And before I got home, my jumper was frozen. It was actually frozen stiff. And uh, I went in and uh, I, would hardly, I could hardly talk to my mother. What have you been doing? Where have you been? And all the rest of it. And I told her what had happened and she couldn't stop laughing. She said, well, it serves you right. And that was all she said. It serves you right. As she said to me lots of times, really. I started school and hated every second of it. And I wasn't there very often. Um, my mother used to take me to school um, well, I say take me, she dragged me to school and I thought I'd enjoy it because my brother used to go and of course I didn't. In fact, I didn't realise till I started school that my brother hated it even more than me. 
The teachers were sadists. They loved uh, to give you a clip around the ear, all slippers, cane, anything could get their hands on, give you a good idea. And so my mum used to take me to school and I used to be sat on the doorstep waiting for her when she got back home. She'd take me back and I'd come back. And uh, in the end, they had to bribe me to stay at school. But unbeknown to them, because my mother worked, my dad worked, my grandmother worked, I was a latchkey kid, as my brother was. Uh, we used to come home and get our own sandwiches or my mum would leave them for us at lunchtime, but I never used to go back. And uh, we used to play down at the brook and go up the gravel pits and, and you know, talk to the blokes working up at the pits there. As, um, as we sort of got a bit older, we, uh, we, we moved from the Sutton Lane um, up to New Road, the brand spanking new council house, which was wonderful because it's got everything in it. Central, well, you haven't got central heat at the time, but it certainly got a, um, hot water and a, and a back boiler to the coal fire and things like this, which, which to us was unheard of. So that, that was good. And of course I started secondary school and uh, I found I loved every second of it. And I really did and uh, excel they put me into 1b to start with because i was the, the teachers from hilton thought i was a total delinquent they really thought i should be into a psychiatric unit rather than another school um because i never went there and uh, i failed my 11 plus uh, so as every other kid who hadn't got money did ain't that funny and uh went to hatton anyway i went into 1b and came top in the class and so I went into 2A, then 3A and then 4A and head boy. So uh, I didn't do too badly at the secondary school. But I also uh, fell in love with gymnastics, which uh, uh, I really enjoyed and my brother did too. And uh, finally started play, um, competing for the school. And then from the school, we started competing in the Trent Valley. And then from that, I started competing in the Midlands. And I was six years champion of the Midlands for trampoline and floor work. So didn't do too badly in that. And ended up being a coach um, and coached in youth clubs and schools uh, for quite a number of years until age took its toll and you have to sort of step back a little bit. All throughout those years, uh, the big love of my life was, um, apart from uh, gymnastics of course, was playing the guitar, which uh, I joined a band uh, when I was 16, I think it was, and uh, I've always been in a band or a duo or solo ever since. And uh, even now, we still play uh, at the ripe old age of 70. So uh, I've got no intention of packing that up just yet. And um, I think one of the highlights was we, we backed Jimmy James and the Vagabonds at Bailey's in Derby. We, uh, we played with the, uh, the Brother Lees, you don't hear about them anymore, but they were very, very big at that time, which was a comedy um, duo, uh, two brothers. And the Grumble Weeds, we played with them at the Talk of the Midlands. And we played at the Talk of the Midlands a couple of times in actual fact. Uh, but the, I think the pinnacle was we played at the Cavern in Liverpool three times, which uh, <clears throat> I just loved every second of that. That was so nostalgic, being a big Beatles freak. When we were old, when we were not quite old enough to drink legally, we used to go out of the village and cycle to uh, the Ostrich at Longford or any other pub out there, and we could get a pint quite easily. But when motorbikes started coming in, one of the uh, the older of our lads uh, had a motorbike, a little Honda 50. And we found that you can get three people on it quite easily if you squeeze up. And so three of us used to jump on this 50cc moped and, uh, and go to the ostrich and uh, two or three pints would get us very drunk and all come back. But coming down the lane, we always had to watch out for Dicko, who was still in the corp corner. We didn't want him to A, see we'd been drinking, and B, see that three of us were on a motorbike, and he'd only got a, a, a learner license anyway. And this particular night, it was dark, and we were coming down Sutton Lane, and he used to switch his engine off so he could coast down the lane. And as we were coming towards the co-op, he says, Christ, Dicko's there. And I was on the back, and I, I leapfrogged off the back not realising how fast he was actually going. And I I rolled and Dicko actually stopped me with his foot on the road. I cut all my elbows up and all my shoulders. 
and he stopped me with his foot and he said that's a funny way to travel Edwin <laughs> and uh, proceeded to laugh like mad he knows what we was up to he knew what we was up to so uh, yes that was another little episode that uh, and then I think the record was on this Honda 54 of us. One sat on the tank and the handlebars, obviously the driver, and then there was two of us on the back of that. And how he got it going, I don't know. But we, had, we managed to get to the ostrich and back with four of us on, <laughs> on this Honda 50, <laughs> which, <laughs> looking back, was, was quite a feat. Yes, there was quite a few of us. There was, uh, used to knock around we all had there was always illegal cars or motorbikes stuck somewhere we we used to go up to gravel pits with motorbikes and uh, scramble around there and uh, we used to have cars uh, for, for quite a quite a number of years uh, because my dad's initial was e and mine was e i used to have his insurance in the, a car that i got with no uh, no insurance so i used to use his Half the time uh, they weren't taxed. Half the time there were no MOT either. And uh, half the time we'd, we'd spend all Saturday morning. Luckily, uh, my brother was a mechanic, so he, he'd help us out uh, with a bonnet up. But m my very first car was a, it was an A35 van with windows in the side. And uh, I think I bought it for five quid. And I ran it for, it must have been a couple of years. And then it stood at the back of the house, at the, at the back of the garage there, until nettles grew through the engine. It'd been there for that long. I, I, I got this very, it was a camping mattress actually, and I used to roll it up and put it in the back of this van. And uh, I'm not gonna tell you the reasons for it. You, you, you thought, sort it out for yourself. But my mum saw it one day. She said, why have you got a mattress in the back of your car? And I said, oh, it's just in case I break down and have to sleep somewhere. Well, she did no more than make me some curtains. <laughs> and she put some curtains on the window in the back of the van. <laughs> and she, quite seriously, she said, well, at least nobody can see you sleeping if you break down. <laughs> Oh, mother. <laughs> but the second car I had was a Mini, which I bought off my father uh, for next to nothing. And uh, I was in Burton where, one day and this guy was looking around it and I came out of the, the shop and what have you. And I, I said, can I help you, mate? He says, is this your car? I says, yeah. He says, how long you had this? And I said, well, not long. I said, even my dad's. I said, my dad had it before me. Well, he said, this has been written off. He said, it was mine. <laughs> and it was a registration, NFA 226. I'll never forget it. And there was always something peculiar about this Mini. And you couldn't put your finger on it at all, but there was something weird about it. And the, the thing about it was, it was two inches longer than any other Mini because it had been welded together the front and the back. <laughs> And this guy said, I completely wrote this car off. <laughs> and it was the insurance. <laughs> How the hell you got it, you know? And that was why it was two inches longer. But the that, that Mini, it, 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 was, it was doomed to fail, that Mini was. I've been chatting this girl up for ages and ages to take her out. And eventually she says, yes. And uh, the brakes on this Mini were never, ever very good then they always had to bleed it. And when he wanted to stop, you had to pump the brakes like mad to get a bit of pressure into the system. Anyway, this particular week, the day before I picked her up to take her out, the brakes were playing me up something rotten. And I thought, well, I haven't got time to start bleeding them again and doing all the business, but I'll chance it. So I picked this girl up and we decided to go to the Roebuck near Draycott. And uh, today, uh, it's, a, quite a, it's a changed completely now, but it was a little country pub then with a car park at the side and fields at the back of that. Well, it's all a housing estate now. But anyway, being a jack of the lad that I was, or I thought I was, I thought, oh, well, you know, arm nearly out the window, you see, you know, uh, driving along, so, you know, a lot faster than I ought to have been. And of course, uh, I was pumping these brakes and things. she kept saying, well, why are you doing that? You know, I said, well, the brakes aren't very clever really, but they're all right, honestly, it'll stop and everything. 
Well, I noticed as we went on that they, they weren't doing much at all, these brakes weren't. However, it didn't deter me from putting my foot down. And as we turned into the car park at the pub, yeah, I was pumping frantically and nothing at all was happening. So we went straight through the hedge <laughs> and into the field at the back. <laughs> And she never said a word. I mean, we got no mobile phones in, in those days. And she never said a word. She just got out of the car, went into the pub and asked the landlord to use his phone. <laughs> and she phoned the dad and the dad came. And uh, I, I was sort of there in the sidelines trying to, you know, and he, he pointed at me and I'm not going to say his exact words, certainly not on camera. But, uh, you know, uh, if you ever, ever come anywhere near my daughter again, he says, I'm going to kill you. And <laughs> anyway, I... <laughs> I thought, oh, well, so I had a pint and I thought, well, I'd better get this eat for rubbish back home. <laughs> How I did, I don't know, because you couldn't stop it. <laughs> At all. So uh, that was the, the end of that uh, relationship, I'm afraid. But, uh, yes, it served me right, really, because the car wasn't roadworthy at all. <laughs> it really wasn't. <laughs> Me and my mate, uh, Dave, uh, he told his mother that he'd passed his test. And uh, I told my mum that Cuth had passed his test so that we could both go out in these cars, you see. And in the village, we had to go run around with this L plate and he had a Morris 1000. And it was a very old one. He got a split windscreen at the front. And uh, we went out with this Morris 1000. As soon as we were out of the village, the L plate came off and off we went. And one night we was uh, we was tootling along and we got a puncture. So uh, we stopped the car, went in the boot, no spare wheel at all. Oh, oh that's no good. So uh, we, we drove far further than we should have done with a flat tyre, wrecked the wheel. Uh, and we, eventually we found this bloody garage and this bloke did give us a, a, a wheel which weren't fit to be on the road. It was actually the borders of Badger. And he said, oh, I should get yourself a spare wheel, which we did. And uh, unfortunately, it hadn't got a jack. Well, it had got a jack, but the jack didn't work. You know, it was there, but it just didn't work. And we didn't know it didn't work until you'd come to use it. And so another puncture, and uh, we got the jack out, it wouldn't work. So what do we do? We've got the spare wheel now, but we hadn't got the jack. So we got this builder's plank, we put it under the side of the car and underrun the builder's plank and tipped the car on its side. It caved the, the ceiling a bit, but at least we managed to do it. And uh, we went to pick these two ladies up and uh, my brother was with us on, on this particular occasion with his girl. So there's six of us in this Morris Minor <laughs> and it was filthy weather. And we was going down this hill after I can't even remember how many pints that we'd had. Uh, and I think the driver had had more than any of us. Going down this hill, like a bat out of hell, and we went around the corner and it tipped over. Yeah, fortunately it uh, it didn't roll completely, it just went on its side. And uh, of course the girls were screaming and everything else. We were laughing, they were screaming. And there was a car behind us and uh, this car stops. and. Of all people in the world, it was my uncle, my uncle Ernie. He says, oh, God, he said, it's young Edwin. He says, and young Ken. He said, I'd better go and get the tractor, he says, and get you towed up, he said. And he went home and got his tractor, because he'd lived on a farm with a farmer. And he actually towed us back to his farm and uh, give us all some whiskey, which was, you know, the last thing we needed, because we were all tanked up anyway. And uh, the following uh, day, he, he run us all home. He, brilliant he was and uh, the following day we went back to pick this car up and the roof was slanted like that so we did no more we sat in the back me, me, me and Dave didn't we just put the roof right and not one wind smashed and so the following week in that very car we went down to Torquay yeah again not a license between us <laughs> and uh, we, we got to Torquay, we, we, we went overnight so that nobody could see how bad drivers we were. And we got to Torquay and uh, my mum packed us up some Weetabix and all the bits and bobs that your mum's always pack you up. And uh, we never even opened the bonnet and, and until it was time to come back or opened the boot till it was time to come back. And then we found out there was a, a family of rats living in the boot and they'd ate all the food anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and on the way back we seized up and it was on the A38 just the other side of Branston 
and uh, the car seized solid because we hadn't even checked the oil. And uh, my dad took us there the following day and we started the car up and it started and actually got us back to Hilton. What a car that was. Yeah, the old, uh, the old Morris Thousand with split windscreen, that was. But, uh, oh yeah, we did have some nails in them days. We used to, but, but that's all we could afford, you know, we used to buy the cheapest we could probably get just to get us from A to B and uh, we used to love it. But we did do some silly things. I mean, you'd never get away with it today. No way. I mean, drinking and driving wasn't it when I was a teenager. So, and I I drove back my friend's car from a New Year's Eve party at um, Bredsel, yeah, Bredsel Hilltop. And uh, he was so drunk. He had this triumph herald. He couldn't stand up, let alone drive. So uh, I drove his car back from Bredsel to Hilton. He stayed with us up New Road. Uh, but my dad woke up about half past five in the morning because he'd been sick everywhere. All up the stairs, all over the landing, all over the bedroom. So we spent most of the following morning clearing sick up. And, uh, oh, that was disgusting. And we felt dreadful. But, uh, no, we didn't do it. We didn't do that too many times after that. <laughs> Uh, they say the good old days. They say the good old days. Uh, I don't think there were. Nobody got any money. You made your own fun. But uh, uh, t today, um, yeah, you know, you've got your laptops, you've got all this lot and, and that, that, that. I don't know. Uh, I, see a f I see a group of kids out now in the pub. Nobody talks to each other. They sit there just texting, um, you know, and looking at the screens. They, they don't sort of converse and laugh with each other. It's all, all eyes down. Whereas, you know, we used to, in most pubs we used to go to, there was at least a pianist. Uh, a lot of them were live bands on a Friday and Saturday night. And uh, because there were no laptops and iPhones and things like that, everybody used to talk. And uh, if there was a pianist, everybody used to have a sing song and a, a good sing and what have you. And they that was the good uh, side of it. Um, on the other hand, is again, yeah, we, yeah, nobody got any money. Nobody got any money. Two apes to rub together. Um, and that, that's why, you know, there were no airs and graces because nobody, <laughs> you couldn't afford to get dressed up in your best suit because your best suit was probably a hand-me-down or a second-hand one anyway. Uh, but, you know, the, the good old days are today. They, they weren't then, really. We, yeah, we had some good times. But I wouldn't like to be a teenager today, I don't think. But the 60s were a good time. You know, the, 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 the transition from uh, crooning, uh, the, the, from, the, from the old war songs to uh, skiffle uh, with Lonnie Donegan. And of course, the Beatles came along and changed the entire face of music globally. And uh, the 60s were a very special time. It was really, really good. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get them back. And I don't think we'll ever get the super groups like the Beatles, Searchers, Hollies, Rockin' Berries, and, you know, The Who. Uh, I don't think we'll, we'll get that time again, unfortunately. But it was a very special time. Uh, pleased to be part of it. <laughs>